Something Live as new research shows that catching the flu makes you six times more likely to have a heart attack. Dr. Ranj explains why lightheadedness and heartburn could be early warning signs. Plus, with her warning of the week, Crime Watch's Michelle Ackley tells us how scammers could be hacking your friends and family's phones to steal your details. And Radio 5 Live presenter Nicky Campbell talks about the new series of his podcast, Different, and how it helped him heal old wounds. Hello and welcome to Morning Live with myself and Rav today and tomorrow. Two days together. Looking forward to That's it. That's a treat. We don't get to do that very much, do no, we? About time to. Yeah, it's going to be nice. <laughs> and we're joined by a team of experts this morning. We've got Dr. Range, and we've got my partner in crime, Nick G. Michelle Ackley. Good to see you. <laughs> and Strictly choreographer Maria as well. Good morning Good to morning. you. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. But we've talked about something on the show before, and this is the nationwide emergency alert. And we're all going to be getting it going through to our mobiles. But, Michelle, we've got a bit of an update as to when we're going to hear this. Yeah, I mean, totally. We were hearing on BBC Breakfast earlier, weren't we, that the government have announced that they're going to be testing the emergency siren on the 23rd of April. Mm -hmm. Today, they've told us that that's going to be at 3pm. I think originally it was going to be in the morning at 9.30. No one wants to be waking up too early on a Sunday morning. <laughs> hey, we've got young kids. The so we've been away. <laughs> <laughs> You're used to it. I'm not used to it. Now, you're not going to need to do anything. Your okay. phone is going to sound an alarm for 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. It's just a test. So, in the future, if there are events like flash floods, wildfires or terrorism, this is a way to be alerted. Now, some domestic violence campaigners have said that they're worried about sufferers of domestic abuse who may have a hidden phone. They might not want that alarm going off. So, the charity Refuge has shared a video of, of how to turn that off. That's great, actually, that yeah. they've drawn attention to that, isn't it? And we will give you another little reminder close to the time of when that alert is actually going to be happening. Um, also on the show today, the Easter bank holiday kicks off tomorrow. And with a little bit of luck, there might be a touch of sunshine. I can see it it's trying, trying to break through. It's, it's trying. <laughs> uh, well, spring is the perfect time to turn our attention to plants. So in 20 minutes, our gardener, Mark Lane, is going to hold a lovely little viewer clinic. I like this. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Good morning, ladies. Yeah, have taken a dive into the main live viewing box, and I'll be answering your question on everything from getting your dash to bloom and also how to water your plants even when you're not at home. Oh, that nice. sounds good. Thank you Thank for that, you. Mark. And if you do have any questions for Mark, please do get in touch in all the usual ways. Plus, we're looking into what's happened to the so-called ghost children who've disappeared from the school system since the pandemic. Now, while some are vulnerable, others are just simply refusing to go to class. It's something presenter OJ Borges is experiencing with his eldest child, but he's definitely not alone. He finds out what helps out there for other mums and dads who are at their wits' end. Yeah, really powerful film, that it one, is. It? Plus, we have a history lesson with a difference. Our star baker, Bryony Mae Williams, is going on a pilgrimage in about 25 minutes to find out why hot cross buns became such a special Easter treat and the centuries-old secret to making them so tasty. And grab the popcorn because it's yes. movie week. Uh, Maria, <laughs> what are we going to be doing today? So today we're going to be working up our upper body. And our... everyone needs to join. It's going to be lots and lots Moana of fun. Moana is a big favourite yes. in my household. So I can take <laughs> yes. some moves back to yes. the boys today. We will love it. Definitely. We will love it. Big favourite in my <laughs> house too. <laughs> we'll have a bit of fun with that later. Definitely. As long as we don't have to wear what Hugo wore there as well, right? Costumes. <laughs> it's terrifying. <laughs> terrifying. OK, first, every six minutes in the UK, Someone is admitted to hospital with a heart attack. It's a massive number. But the sooner you can get treatment, the better your chance of survival. In just a moment, we're going to be learning some of the signs to look out for. But first, Dr Range, there has been some new research into what can actually cause a heart attack. Yeah, so a heart attack happens when there's a problem in the blood supply to the heart. Interestingly, the number of heart attacks actually goes up during the winter. Lots of different mm. reasons for that. There's a direct effect of the cold, obviously. But this research from the Netherlands shows a direct effect of flu on your risk of having a heart attack. And what they showed was that your chances of having a heart attack in the week after having the flu can go up by up to six times, oh, which wow. is a significant increase. 
Why is that? Lots of theories. Expert think, experts think it could be a combination of the body's response to the flu virus and how it fights it off. It could be because when you're unwell, especially when you've got flu, it puts extra strain on your heart and lungs. That increases your risk. Mm -hmm. But also because the flu virus possibly makes the blood a bit more sticky and that makes it more likely to clot and therefore block those arteries to the heart. All of this together just serves as a reminder. Get your flu vaccine if you're at risk, especially in those winter months. Yeah. yeah, and there's another new study today that says how the Mediterranean diet can actually lower the risk of heart attacks. But I do feel like I've been hearing this for yeah. years. Is this new? Yeah, we've known this for a long time. Yeah. Uh, Mediterranean people... Mediterranean people tend to have healthier outcomes, especially when it comes to their heart health. This is a study that grouped a bunch of studies together and looked at over 35,000 people mm -hmm. and just adds extra weight to that. They looked at six different sort of diet variations. One of them was the Mediterranean diet. And what they found was that you have a reduced risk of dying from anything, including heart attacks and strokes, irrespective of whether you're low and high risk. Mm -hmm. So um, another thing to say, basically, be careful at what you're eating. And it's quite easy to follow. All you've got to do is increase the plant-based content in your diet, some more right. fruit and veg. Um, beans, lentils, whole grains, nuts, seeds, oily fish, good fats like olive oil, reduce bad fats, and especially cut down things like processed meat, sweet and salty foods as well. Quite easy little changes to yeah, make. Yeah, things that we can all do. And, and despite our best efforts though, Range, they, they can and still do occur, heart attacks. So what can we do to spot the signs? Yeah, so I suppose it's important to clarify that a heart attack is different from a cardiac arrest. A heart attack is a blood supply problem to the muscle mm -hmm. of the heart. A cardiac arrest is an electrical problem. But what can happen is when you've got a problem in the blood supply, it's to the heart, it starves the heart muscle of oxygen and nutrients. That leads to damage and death of the heart muscle itself. And if it's bad enough, that can then lead to a cardiac arrest. Classic symptoms, particularly in men, will be things like chest pain, usually starts centrally, starts radiating up to the neck and down the left arm. Um, shortness of breath, feeling lightheaded or dizzy and feeling sick. And classically, a lot of people get this sense of impending doom, that something seriously wrong is happening. But the important point to note is that in women, symptoms can be very different to men. Oh, really? They're more likely to have vague symptoms that come on more gradually. The pain in their chest may actually feel more like a squeezing than a pain. Often it gets confused for things like heartburn. And also they're more likely to have symptoms that are not related to chest pain at all. So more likely to get shortness of breath, pain that radiates into their back or into their stomach, fatigue or even sweating. So really important to be mindful of that. That's so interesting, isn't it? And also I feel like a lot of those symptoms that you've just listed mm. are things that we all feel, <clears throat> you know, during the week now and again. Yes. Literally, as you said, tightness of <laughs> chest. Yeah. I was like, is mine tight? <laughs> um, how do we know if it is something more serious than we yeah. need? I to totally see get that because some of those symptoms can be quite vague, but you're unlikely to just have one symptom. Right. If you're having a heart attack, you're probably going to feel pretty unwell. You're probably probably going to have a collection of symptoms. And it's important to pick up early because we know that if you do, over seven out of ten people will survive a heart mm -hmm. attack. Back in the 1960s, seven in ten people used to pass away because of a heart attack. So we have made significant advances. But if you think you're having a heart attack, pick up that phone, call 999. These are the calls that will be prioritised, especially during things like ambulance strikes if they're happening. These are the things we want to know. Very much an emergency. Yeah. But Ranch, if you're, if you're with someone and you, you think they are having a heart attack, is there anything that we can do if we haven't got a doctor like yourself there? Yes, there are. there is a lot that we can do and a lot that you can do to help. First and foremost, please remain calm and call 999. Make sure help is on the way. Try to get the person in a comfortable position, ideally in a W sort of position where they're sitting up. Okay. Give them 300 milligrams of aspirin. That's an adult aspirin to chew slowly, unless they're a child under the age of 16 or they're allergic to aspirin. If they've got angina medication, ask them to take that as well. Mm -hmm. And stay with them, keep an eye on them. If they become unresponsive, you may have to start CPR. So be prepared for that as well. Brilliant. Stay calm. Advice, it's then. easier said yes. than done, but you have to. Got to do it. it. Absolutely. So important. Thank, Thank you. you. And if you want to see a video of Ranj actually teaching you how to perform CPR that you just mentioned there, we've got one on our Instagram page.
We do. Uh, now, while some illnesses can be treated in hospital, there are other conditions that are much harder to tackle. Now, since the pandemic, over 100,000 children have dropped out of the education system. Now, some have simply never returned and others are persistently absent due to conditions like anxiety. Presenter OJ Borge has had first-hand experience of his own child refusing to go to school, so he wanted to find out what help there is for families who are facing the same situation. More than 140,000 school children in England are officially severely absent, missing at least 50% of classes. Some simply vanished off the school registers after the pandemic. These are so-called ghost children and there are major worries over their welfare. But there are others who are the so-called school refusers who are too anxious to attend class. I know all about this category as I have a child who is one of them. There is a lot of shame involved for children and parents when school avoidance happens. It makes you feel like a failure, something I know all too well myself and my wife, and it's ridden massively since pre-pandemic levels. To put it simply, some children have never gone back. While I'm new to the world of emotionally based school avoidance or EBSA, I'm certainly not alone. Liz is mum to 10 year old Amber. It's a busy time for Amber as she is preparing for her SATs exams and in a matter of months will be moving to high school. But she's refusing to attend school, only making it once or twice a week. I guess the first question is, how did this morning go? Um, not well. Um, we, got, we made it as far as the school grounds. Um, we spent about an hour by the, by, just by the gate um, and then I had to make the decision that we weren't going to make it in. A couple of weeks ago she wouldn't go off the driveway. She laid for two hours, just laid prone on the driveway. If I push her, if I, if I abandon her, then you know she's, I'm someone she trusts and she needs to trust that I'm going to do what's best for her, I think. So yeah, we came home. <laughs> what was that like for you when you came home? It's hard, it's hard. I always often have a little cry and feel really guilty and replay over the morning and decide whether I did the right thing. Amber is autistic and struggles with large groups of people, which is one of the reasons she refuses to go to school. Is she fine when she's in school? She's told me that she's scared, she doesn't feel safe, she's anxious, she's worried, that's not being fine, but she appears fine because She'll nod and smile and say that she's OK if a teacher asks her. How much time do you spend, though, beating yourself up about it? Hours. Hours and hours. I take, I've, I've had to take time off work sometimes because the stress on me has been so much that it feels like I'm spinning so many plates. I, I lie awake at night thinking about it. Do you find yourself constantly asking, what do I do? And getting so many different bits of advice, you then still don't know what to do. Yeah, and I have to say her school, you know, I would say they're pretty supportive and will give advice. Even this morning, you know, the teacher saying, oh, just leave her. And then someone else will say, oh, have you tried giving her rewards? Have you tried bribing her? We have tried that, and, and in the short term that works and then it stops working. Do you know, it's more than just social pressure. Parents of children not attending school often live in fear of prosecution, with fines totalling £8.6 million last year. Has anyone ever contacted you about, about attendance? Yes, I've had a letter this year, um, which is the first in the process which says that Amber is now what is considered persistently absent. I have heard about parents who have gone through prosecution for this kind of thing, and I, it keeps me awake. Rob Williams is the policy advisor for the National Association of Head Teachers. A former head teacher himself, he recently gave evidence to the Government Select Committee on School Attendance. If my child or a child is permanently not in school, how could it affect their future? It depends really for the reasons why they're, they're absent. And we, what we're seeing is obviously school absence is, a, is really a symptom of uh, sometimes of underlying issues. So that might be a, a mental health issue, uh, an issue with anxiety, or it might be other issues in the, in the families. You know, we know from absence figures that the children who, at the end of primary school, start to get into a pattern of non-attendance, the risk is when they go into secondary school, that worsens over the first few years of high school. And of course, as they lead into their formal qualifications, the GCSEs and so forth, that can have a big impact. But when we get into children who aren't going to school at all, I've, I've heard them referred to as ghost children. Who are those ghost children? Because they don't seem to appear on any register at all. Children who are not re-engaged, they're missing at least half of their education. 
Um, and the problem for those, of course, is that when they're not in school, it's unclear where they are. Safeguarding is everybody's responsibility, and so I think we all have a role to play in that. And it's important we know where children are just to make sure we can keep them safe. But you know this problem, it is getting worse, not better. Dr Paul Kelly is an educational psychologist who works with school refusers. His job is to make recommendations on the best way forward for everyone involved. Five years ago, I'd never heard of EBS, I'd never heard of it, possibly because I didn't have a child who was going through it. Is it becoming more common? The statistics tell us that there are more children struggling to attend school. Um, uh, we are more aware of it, and for those two reasons, it's certainly in our everyday life more as psychologists than it was um, a long time ago, definitely. What would be your three takeaways? Things, if they think their child, or maybe they have missed a day, or there's that anxiety in the evening, what would you do, your three takeaways? First of all, set aside time, not just once, but over and over again, to talk with your child, and more important than talking, listen. But really, listen with open ears. The second is maintain a good relationship with the school. Be honest about the difficulties you're experiencing at home. And the third thing I would say is be aware of the pressure you are under as a parent. The pressure to get your child to attend, the pressure to fix the problem. And in this situation, try, if you can, take that pressure off yourself. You're unlikely to be able to fix it with any quick fix. It's going to take time. This today has been one of the most personal things that I've worked on. One thing I have learned is that it's okay. Do not beat yourself up as a parent because it's overwhelming, but there are specialists, there are people who can help you and find what is right for your child. Yeah, gosh, I've actually got a few friends who are going through a very similar thing to OJ. And you know, the school support's so important, just having that support, it's a lot of pressure on the so family. Hard. We heard it from the film there, parents almost feeling guilty. Yeah, which they shouldn't have of course caused, not. Great film, and thank you to OJ and Liz there. Really is a time to rely on family and friends, that's for sure. It is indeed. Now, we're talking about the warning of the week and my Crime Watch co-host, Michelle Ackley, is telling us how scammers are using our friendships to con us out of money. What's going on, Michelle? Yeah, so Action Fraud have received over 60 reports relating to a scam where criminals are stealing access to a WhatsApp user's account. Right. So this all starts by a criminal hacking into another WhatsApp user's account where your contact is on their list, so your number Okay. is in that yeah. WhatsApp holder's phone. So then the criminal will decide to have a conversation with you. They'll message you over WhatsApp, engage in a chat. At this point, there'd be no red flags or alarm bells because you've most likely got that number. I think it's someone you know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It could be a close family member. It could be your best mate, which you contact every single day. Yeah. And if the criminal's clever, they'll know the kind of language that they use and you use and mm -hmm. they'll keep it, you know, under the radar. What will also be happening behind the scenes with the fraudster is they'll be trying to log into your WhatsApp account through your mobile number. Right. So you'll receive a text message on your phone with a six-digit code. This is essentially, you can okay, see it on the screen yeah. now, a verification code to get into your account. <gasps> And what the fraudster will do is they'll say something like, oh, you know what I've done? I've just sent you a six-digit code by mistake. I'm sorry, it's just because I've been messaging you. I've sent it to you by accident. Oh, is God. there any chance that you can send that code Sneaky. back to me? And then you send that code to them, they are able to access your account and block you out of it. So now straight away they're in your account the same exactly. way they're just in one of your friends' accounts. Yes. And it goes on and on from and you there. And trust you trust them, don't you? It is quite scary. So what will then happen if once they've got that access to your WhatsApp group and, well, or well, your number, I suppose? They've got everything, haven't they? That's the thing, they've got everything. They really have, Kimberly. And as you said, Rav, the cycle starts again. They've got a whole new contact list. They can start contacting all the people yeah. and trying to scam them. And it's almost a step on from... Do you remember the WhatsApp scam that we mentioned before on Morning Live, which is... A about the scammers yes. trying to con you. The, the hey mum, for money. Hey mom, can and I, stuff, you know, yeah. I've, lost my, I've lost my card, can I have some money? This becomes more convincing because you've already got the number in your phone. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes we just forget how much information we exchange yeah. in WhatsApp messages. If I think through messages that I've sent in the past, you might have your national insurance number, your driving licence details, your passport information. And you so do got send access it to, that. to your family and friends, don't you? Because do, it's think? easy, isn't yeah. it? So yeah. we don't want this to happen to no. anyone else. So what can we do to protect ourselves? Yeah, so there is some good news with this. We can protect ourselves. One of the first things that we all need to do is set up two-step 
verification. Oh. It essentially just gives you that extra layer of protection. It makes it harder for a scammer to try and scam you. So what you oh, need yeah, to do is this on here, that. tap settings, go to account, tap two-step verification, and then enable or turn on and then you just follow the instructions from there it'll ask you for the six digit code really simple to do another thing that i would say is that unfortunately we need to start being a bit more skeptical when we're messaging people yeah and don't trust stop, people don't, you know, and it's, it's awful isn't it? Say, isn't it but we do have to be like that especially if they start asking you for digits, pin cones, bank details, yeah. all that kind of stuff. You should never give a six-digit code, should you? Never give that away. Just for you. And have a conversation over the phone. I always do like a WhatsApp video with my mum or my brother. At least I can see their face then. Yeah. You can hear Such someone's Such a good voice. tip, though, isn't it? Sure. It's easy yeah. to do, really simple one yeah, to do that. exactly. Another really key thing as well is that you can report in WhatsApp, In um, you can report spam messages, you can uh, yeah. block a sender within the WhatsApp. So you just need to press on the number or contact name at the top of the message, scroll down, and select report and then follow the instructions again and you know what can you do if you've fallen victim as many of us will to a scam like this yeah we really need to report it the more report, we report, report these report. scams the better aware and enabled that we can be so in england wales northern ireland if you're a victim of fraud you can contact action fraud or 0300 123 2040 in Scotland, it's Police Scotland, report it to 101. Mm -hmm. And if you have handed over any bank details, make sure you contact your bank as soon. Straight away. That's yeah, just away. brilliant information. And we will make sure that we put all of that information on our website. Um, thanks so much, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. Still to come, Radio 5 Live presenter Nicky Campbell has interviewed thousands of people during his career. We spoke to him earlier today, and he explained why a guest on his podcast, Different, led to one of the toughest conversations he's ever had. We're going to be showing you that in around 10 minutes' time. And she promises Strictly Fitness will be a walk in the park or, at the very least, a swim in the sea. <laughs> Strictly choreographer Maria is teaching us... 100%. Okay. She loves that film. Um, first, though, we could all be getting outside more in the next couple of days with a long Easter bank holiday weekend just around the corner. And for some of us, a little bit of sun. It could be the perfect time for a spot of gardening. And our inbox is full of questions for gardener Mark Lane. So let's get straight let's. to it. Uh, good morning, Mark. Good morning, guys. Morning. morning, morning. Right, so the first question we've got from Stuart. He has written in about his daffodils. He says, 18 months ago, I planted 150 daffodils. Last year, they were great, but this year, about 25% of them have gone blind. What can I do to get the blind ones flowering again? So uh, how can you help, Stuart? And what does blind daffodils mean, Mark? Uh, so basically, that means that they haven't flowered before that particular year and it's a great question Stuart now there could be a number of reasons but I'll sort of pick out the main one so the first one could be that you may have planted them at the wrong time of the year so the thing with daffodils is you must get them in the ground before the end of September because that way they've got the three months over the November December uh, January October November December and then they got January February March and then they'll start flowering so they get six months of growing mm -hmm. within the ground Another thing to think about is when you're planting your bulbs, plant them on a layer of horticultural grit or horticultural sand, and that will actually help with the drainage. Now, I always treat bulbs a bit like annuals, uh, so I always replenish them year on year because it is inevitable that some will fail, fail. So don't panic too much. What you could also do, when you start seeing those little, what we call noses, appearing above the soil with that little bit of greenery, mm -hmm. Start feeding it with a high potash feed, just like tomato feed, once a week, and that will also help build up those reserves. But one of the key things is maybe the foliage. Don't tidy up all that foliage after the flowers have disappeared. You must keep the foliage there for at least mm. six weeks. And that way, the photosynthesizes, it gets back down into the bulb, ready for the following year. Ooh, so there you right. go. There <laughs> now you know what to do with your daffodils. <laughs> We've got another video message for you from Kath. Let's have a little look. Some of my seedlings are ready for potting on, which I shall do in the next few days. I've got cosmos, sunflowers and sweet peas, but I'm going on holiday soon. How can I keep them watered without bothering a neighbour? Good question. Good question, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question, Kath. Uh, it's really quite simple here. So uh, just get yourself a nice uh, plastic bottle, go recycle a plastic bottle, make a hole in the lid, and then using an eco-friendly cotton bud, stick a cotton bud through the hole in the lid. Very, oh, very yeah. simple. You then fill it up, fill your bottle up with water, put, close up the lid, 
and then by using a, some chopsticks or a bamboo cane, just stick some bamboo cane so you can put it into the soil and that will then drip, drip, drip by capillary action. And it means that the plant will only take the amount of water that it actually needs. Now you can buy capillary matting from the garden center or from a DIY store. It will cost you about five pounds, but you know, recycle your plastic bottle, a nice little eco-friendly cotton bud, and you've got something for free. That's Absolutely genius. free is brilliant. Genius. Great one, that one, Mark. <laughs> uh, we've got one more video question. This time it's from Nick. Hi, Mark. My garden has been bare over the winter months. What plants would you recommend that are winter flowering and have a perfume? Ooh. Ooh. Oh, that's have a good a one. That's a really good one. Yeah, because a lot of people think that a winter garden is quite a boring garden. Um, but no, 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 definitely not. So I would recommend, so we're looking at probably a period from November through to sort of early March. That's what I would classify as winter type. So something like witch hazel. Witch hazel is brilliant. You get wonderful colours. You can get yellows, oranges, and even bright red. That gorgeous, delicious witch hazel scent. Just go up to the flowers, mm. gently breathe on it. The warm breath will release that scent. It really is intoxicating. Another great one is sarcococca. Now, sarcococca, otherwise known as the Christmas fox, it has quite insignificant flowers, but oh, crikey, does it pack a punch. <laughs> it has a flower from November all the way through to March. Have it somewhere near a back door or a front door and you will get a delicious scent. It's quite sweet, but it is absolutely intoxicating and beautiful. Another great one is the winter honeysuckle. We all know about the honeysuckles during the summertime, but the winter honeysuckle is beautiful. It has these pure white flowers and you don't even have to go around a corner and you will get that smell. It is absolutely beautiful. So those are three really good shrubs to use. And then yeah. for ground cover, what I would use is something like Noreen. Noreen is beautiful. It has these beautiful, bright pink star-like flowers and a very delicate scent when you get your nose up close. And then another great one is Iris reticulata and even some species tulips. These come in a range of colours. They're quite deep. Oh, they only get to about 10 to 12 centimetres in height, but they are beautiful. And they also have a really lovely sweet scent to them as well. So go for the shrubs. Definitely. Put some brown cover down as well. Oh. And you've got yourself a oh, beautiful you. week. Thank you. Mark, thank you so Mark, much. I just love listening to the passion when you talk about plants. Thank you so much. Uh, now, I'm going to be honest, I might not be the most green-fingered person in the world. <laughs> so I won't be pulling on my gardening gloves this weekend, but there is one Easter tradition that I can definitely get on board with, and that's eating hot cross buns. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you on both of those. Um, <laughs> millions are sold every year with flavours ranging from cheese to chocolate, so we've sent Chef Bryony Mae Williams back to her baking roots to find out how the sticky treat ended up on our plates. This Easter, millions of hot cross buns will be eaten in the UK and they are one of my favourite seasonal treats. They're a symbol of the Christian faith and have been eaten at Easter time for more than 650 years and it's believed that they were created here at St Albans Cathedral. Cathedral guide Stephen De Silva is an expert on the history of the hot cross bun. Almost 700 years ago, one of the monks, Brother Thomas Rockcliffe, bakes small, sweet, spiced buns marked with the sign of the cross, and he gives them out to the poor and the pilgrims on Good Friday, 1361. Oh my goodness, 700 years. That's how old the story is. So what do we know about his recipe? It's not as sweet as a normal hot cross bun in the shop today. It's a little bit more savory, and it has a very particular secret spice. Mm. Now, this is called Grains of Paradise. The medieval spice traders said that it only grew in the Garden of Eden and it was collected by the spice traders and brought to Europe to be sold only to the wealthy. Now, here, the abbot of St Albans was one of the wealthiest people in the area and maybe the abbot really did have grains of paradise in his kitchen. Known today as the Alban Bun, they are still made here every year throughout Lent. These days, they don't use grains of paradise, but they do have their own top secret blend of spices. Now, they won't let me have the secret recipe, but they have said I can help out in the kitchen and I can't resist a little bit of baking. Baker Grace Tilson has been making Alban buns for five years. Hello, Grace. Hi. How are you? Good, thank you. Good. Now, you make a lot of Alban buns, don't you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> 
throughout length make over a hundred every day. A hundred every day? Over a hundred, yes. Oh my goodness, that is a lot of buns. The recipe may be secret, but to make something similar at home, you'll need 640 grams of plain flour, 50 grams of unsalted butter, half a teaspoon of salt, two teaspoons of cinnamon powder, two teaspoons of allspice, 110 grams of caster sugar, 210 grams of currants, one lightly beaten egg, three tablespoons of dry yeast, 375 milliliters of lukewarm milk, and two tablespoons of caster sugar in a third of a cup of water to glaze. Activate the yeast in the lukewarm milk and then set aside. Rub the butter into the flour. How's that looking? You can tell me, Grace. Be a harsh critic. Come on, it's all right. <laughs> no, that looks pretty good. You, you, you can start. <laughs> there we go, pretty good. <laughs> and then add your spices, sugar, salt and currants. Give those a good mix round. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. Mix and then add the egg. Once they've been combined well, add the yeast and milk. Very important part. Yes. And knead until elastic. Leave the dough to rest or prove in a warm place until it's doubled in size. So I believe you've already very kindly prepared one that's proved and is ready to be shaped. Is that right? That's right. Yes, you do. Excellent. Is. Flour your surface. Right, yes. right, you ready? I'm going to do this like a fancy chef, OK? <laughs> and shape the dough into balls. So now you just flour it a little bit. Yeah. Leave to prove until it doubles in size once more. Now I'm going to cut the crosses on. Score crosses into the top and then pop in a preheated oven at 180 degrees centigrade for 22 minutes or until golden brown. Once they're done, glaze with the sugar water. And the moment of truth. That is absolutely delicious. We've rounded up a panel of cathedral staff to see what they make of album buns. I really like it. Lots of butter on it. Mm. What's his name? Not too sweet. I really like them because they're a bit spicier than a regular bun. I'm actually not a fan of a regular bun because I'm not a big raisin fan, but I'll make an exception for an Auburn bun. OK, <laughs> so you prefer the Auburn bun over the modern hot cross bun? I do. Unpopular opinion, but yeah, I definitely do. OK. And in terms of the symbolism of the bun, what does that mean to you? The fact that the cross is there is a reminder of what this time of the year is about. And we only serve it here during Lent and Easter. Excellent. Yeah. Fantastic. They're a hit. Not only are these buns part of baking history, they're the perfect way to celebrate Easter. Oh, they look lovely. Are you a fan? Oh, I love a hot cross bun. Yeah. Loads of butter? Yeah, you it's need the only way, it, right? Yeah, you've got to. It's got to be done. <laughs> <laughs> and just like hot cross buns belong to Easter, Nicky Campbell belongs on our screens and airwaves. He's been a fixture on the BBC for the past 36 years and counting. Yes, from Top of the Pops to Watchdog and all the radio shows in between. And now he's going digital. This year, he's released the second series of his podcast, Different. Nikki, you must be exhausted. <laughs> Good morning. Kimberly, it's absolutely ludicrous. But there we are, still here, still going. In your career lovely... from career to career, but still here. Yes, yeah, still here <laughs> in your lovely new Five Live studio. It looks fab. Can you show us around a little bit? That's yeah, great. we just get the idea here. Basically, what we're doing with the Five Live phone in which we like to think is agenda setting. They're Ooh. now going to put it on the news channel and also BBC Two and the iPlayer. It's part of the modernisation of the news channel, reaching audiences, audiences reaching us, people out there talking about uh, the stuff they really want to talk about every morning between 9 and uh, 11, which is a good time to be on yeah, the television brilliant. or the radio. It, it is, yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, there's, there's going to be pictures too. I can't wait. It's really, really exciting. And I think it's, it's a difficult thing. It's a difficult project to do radio on the TV, but the team working on this have been fantastic. And I, I think we're going to crack it. So you can join us every morning. You can listen and you can watch as well. Yeah, wow. exciting. Comes in, it starts in a couple of weeks. Exciting times. Would well, you show us um, what it looks like in the studio, Nikki? And oh, there we go. It does look great. And what we can there see that. So, um, let's talk about this podcast because, of course, you're now in the second series yes. um, that you're doing now. So, how do you pick the amazing people that appear on it? On the podcast, which yes. is uh, separate from this, of course. But yeah, BBC Sounds. You can get that. Well, it's called different, and I just love talking to people. One of the things I've loved doing most over the years, I used to do a late-night show on Radio 1 called Into the Night, and we'd long-form interviews. You can't really do that in news. 
because you're going to rat me in a minute anyway. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, it's uh, it's great to talk to people and really get into the issues. And I just I just pick you know really really different people, and it's really wide ranging. The, the current podcast is Joy Milne, who's a super smeller. She's got an incredible genetic ability to smell beyond what normal humans can smell. Oh wow! Oh, that and, is uh, yeah, wow. She can she can smell. They're using her in medicine. She can smell Parkinson's disease, and also she she has such detailed smell. It's almost like an animal ability to smell. And her mother could do it before her. That's and her mother Ooh. before her. Like I had, um, I just washed my hands. I had soap on my hand, and I said, what? I, and I put it. What's that smell like, John? Because all, all she could smell was were the chemicals. Because we don't realise how many chemicals are in perfume and cologne and soap. She prefers natural smells. So basically, when somebody breaks wind, that is far better to her than Chanel. <laughs> Oh, gosh. <laughs> Didn't expect that. Well, it is. It's no. fascinating, but, um, yeah, crazy. I mean, I know, Nikki, that you have had some very difficult conversations on the podcast as well. Um, I think the first episode must have been incredibly tough for you. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Wow, it's one of the most intense conversations I've ever had in my life. But basically, mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of this, we, we've been campaigning, we've been fighting to bring um, some um, abusers to justice who taught us at our school in the 1970s. Uh, one of whom is dead, but he was my abuser and he abused many other boys. And when this all came out and when I, I put it on the media and I did it on the podcast as well on BBC Sounds uh, in, the, in the first series, mm -hmm. um, our, our abuser's daughter, um, and uh, his name was, he's dead, his name was Hamish Dawson. And she got in touch and uh, reached out, as they say, and she said, look, anyone who suffered from my father, please get them to in touch with me. She had a very difficult time in her family. She's an incredible woman, Jenny. And I had this, this conversation with her in a studio and it was, um, it, it was just, it was one of the most, inc uh, you know, genuinely one of the most incredible um, conversations I've had in my life. She was uh, remarkable um, talking about her father, talking about her family. And she said, I, the first thing she said to me is, I'm sorry. I said, you've got nothing to apologize for. It's not, it's not you. you, you suffered as well. You are also a victim you know, of his abuse. So that's, that's, in the, that's in the current series. Thank you for asking about that because it's, it's, a, it's a passionate thing for a lot of us now to try and get something done yeah, about well, what I happened think, to us know, in the 70s. Nikki, it's important that, you know, you're coming on here to speak about it. People are talking about it and you're bringing that awareness to it. So thank you so much for, for doing that Thanks, today. Nikki. Thanks, Nikki. And you can listen to all episodes of Nikki's podcast, Different, on BBC Sounds right now. And if you've been affected by abuse, details of organisations offering information and support are available at bbc.co.uk forward slash action line. Well, leaving Nikki in his studio in London, we're now heading further down south to Devon and a very special farm that's trying to protect animals which are almost extinct now in the UK. But forget dinosaurs and dodos, we're mm -hmm. looking back at how storks, glowworms and beavers are getting a second chance in this country. When they're little, they kind of look like pterodactyls. Derek Gow has a passion for white storks. They're noisy, they're gregarious, they're just birds that are hard to ignore. Storks used to be common across the UK, but now they're extinct here due to overhunting and habitat loss. There haven't been storks in Britain for maybe 500 years. For the last 40 years, Derek has devoted his life to conservation. He rears storks and, as well as some of Britain's other rarest species, on his farm in Devon. So there are still some conventional farm animals here. But the other animals that are here are not domestic animals. So there's about a 1,000 water voles for reintroduction projects that we kept to breed. We have about 15 wildcats. And there are three family groups of Eurasian beavers. Oh, well, the geese are the lawnmowers. But um, people also like them. They give the farm character. Good morning to you as well. Derek works with conservationists across the UK to bring endangered species back to the British countryside. So what we have in front of us here is our flock of storks. There's about 30 birds. Storks are an endearing species. They've always been associated with regeneration, rebirth, hope and renewal. So in some ways it's quite fitting. They started to produce their first chicks in, in, in the year of COVID. And these birds build clatter to, to bond with each other. 
They are birds that are long-lived, so they can live right into the 40s and breed right into the 40s. Derek isn't attached to any mainstream organisation. Some wildlife experts see him as a maverick, but Derek is passionate about getting wildlife back into our landscape. The whole point of this is that we can have spectacular wildlife here. The only reason we don't have it is because we killed it in the past and destroyed its living environment. But it doesn't need to be that way. The farm recently welcomed some new young storks. They came from Poland, where stork populations are thriving. The Polish birds we have are the only breeding stock we could get. And in Poland, many of them every year collide with power lines or their parents die for whatever reason, the babies are orphaned. And of course, because storks are common birds in Poland, there is nothing they can do with them. So that's why the Polish storks are here, breeding birds to begin a process. The new storks from Poland are smaller and weaker than Derek's adult flock. So to give them the best chance of success, is moving them to an aviary owned by a friend in Bodmin. They have to be boxed up for the journey for their own protection. Right, good job. On this farm, 25 miles away, Derek knows the storks will be safer and they've got everything they need for a happy life. What's in this pen that's particularly useful for the storks is you can see they've got really low platforms, so our platforms are all higher, plenty of sticks, and also I mean, very kindly they put a shed in. I'm not quite sure of the stork. So, um, I have no intention of retiring any time soon. Lovely film there. <laughs> now, earlier we were talking about WhatsApp scams. We just want to clear up quickly that once scammers have access to your account, they can't actually see old messages, but they can see all the new ones going forward. So, as Michelle said, it is a scam you want to be wary of. Please watch out for that. Yes. Now it's time for Strictly Fitness with Maria, so let's cue the music. Oh, oh look at that. <laughs> That's an entrance. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Now, we're at our very own movie week yes. and morning live this week. Yes. So, what routine are we learning today? What choreography? But well, you're not wearing your costumes. I've got them. <laughs> oh, oh we, we left happened? them in the green room. Oh. Never mind. Yeah, okay. Don't give it's them okay. any ideas. Next time. Next time. Um, Next time. So, Next what other moves have you got for us today? <laughs> so, today we're going to start warming up with forward punches, just like that. Good. Okay. Really stretch the arms and involve the shoulders as well so we tone up those arms. Good, excellent, yes. perfect. As well, Our so second, fine. yes, absolutely. All the things that we're going to do today could be doing seated. Great. Our second move for today is we're going to reach for the ceiling and reach. Good, really stretch out the sides, warm up those arms, beautiful, good. Nice. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, okay. now, and our strictly yeah. move for today is going to be hands to the ceiling, on the hips and on the knees. So we're going to go one, two and three. One, two, and three. And all the moves that we're going to do, we're going to do them in four. Are we ready? Four times. Four times. Okay. So four times. Right. Four times. Four times. Nice and easy. Everyone nice ready for this? Are you ready? Yeah, ready? Yeah, ready? Man, you ready? Take it away, Alan. You ready? With an upper body <laughs> workout, it's Maria Tiatian.